tell you, I, uh, I've seen things you people would not believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. <laughs> I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tenhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost. Like tears in the rain. Time to die. Welcome back <laughs> to Dying That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and I'm here with my good buddy, Ty Frank, and we're excited tonight because we're going to talk about something that we both love deeply. What are we talking about today, Ty? Uh, well, I mean, one th- I think we agree is one of the greatest science fiction films of all time. I would say, I would go as far as say it is the greatest science fiction noir film of all time. Ridley Scott's masterpiece, Blade Runner. One of the things I learned in researching this, and I'm, you probably already know that, but what I didn't know is that Ridley Scott considers Blade Runner in the same universe as Alien, right? I know he does, and it's, yeah. You don't seem to like, you, know, you seem no, to have problems with that. You know, this goes back to our conversation about Ridley Scott, that, that while Ridley Scott is one of the most brilliant visual filmmakers of all time, mm-hmm. and incredibly brilliant at evoking emotion from mm-hmm. the visuals, I don't love his story sense. I don't love what he thinks is the story and what he doesn't think is the story. I, I, he and I have strong disagreements on story. It doesn't matter because his visuals are so amazing that I don't care. Like, I'll just go along for the ride because his visuals are incredible. But often the things that he thinks make a good story, like he really, we can get into this later, but he really fell in love with some ideas about Blade Runner later that I thought were terrible ideas. That the new Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, sort of retconned out. So Ridley had said all this stuff about the original Blade Runner that then when Blade Runner 2049 came out, it got rid of those ideas, which I was I was grateful to for doing that. But But this idea that Blade Runner and Alien are in the same universe don't think that makes either universe better. I think that makes them both worse. If you're going to change something about a story, you're going to add something. This is my writer talking, my writer self talking. If you're going to add something to a story, always the first question you ask is, does this make the story better or worse? And no matter what the thing is, no matter how much you're in love with an idea, if it doesn't make the story better, it doesn't belong there. Get rid of it. You know, it's the whole kill your darlings thing, right? You know, no matter how much you love a scene or love a character or love a line of dialogue, if overall it doesn't make the story better, then it's a bad addition. And I think this whole thing of like, oh, they're in the same universe. Like that seems like the idea that like the 13 year old self thinks is a good idea where you're like, yeah, that'd be so cool. But if you really think about it from a story sense, it doesn't make any sense. And it just makes both universes dumber. Well, what is the time? Because so I haven't thought that through i heard about it and i was like oh and i haven't thought about aliens like when they come back to earth but i think about you know i think about the replicant in alien when the the alien pops out and certain things so you're right on surface level you hear that and you're like that's fucking cool and it's like a cool thing like two of your favorite films existing in the same universe and yeah they are off world and and then oh there is a replicant there that they didn't know was a replicant oh and then it has an alien inside of it and has So there was something about it that seemed cool, but it's probably one of those things that if you think through and like, you know, the proper timelines and, you know, and you start looking at aliens, the other movie, it just sounds like something that's cool to say on the surface level that people would be like, oh, that's cool. You know, that's exactly right. That's what I mean by it's the thing that your 13 year old self thinks is cool, because when you're 13, you throw out ideas and you don't think through the implications. You just like the surface of it. Right. Right. Like, you know, but if transformers and uh dragon ball z were in the same universe oh that'd be fucking cool they could be fighting robots right but then you know you actually examine the idea and it doesn't make a lick of sense so it's kind of that idea for me where it's like you throw it out and you go oh that sounds cool but the minute you think about it at all just the whole thing falls apart it's it's interesting because i thought deeply about this movie uh before i started and and one thing that's rare with this movie than any movie i've ever seen before it becomes more and more compelling the more I watch it. Yeah. And so usually a lot of layers to it, a lot of layers. And usually if I love a movie, if I watch it over and over and eventually it kind of, even though you still love and you appreciate it, it'll wear itself out. But the fact that I'm watching it as if the first time and, uh, when we were doing season five or season six, me and, uh, 
uh, Miller and um, Breck went to the Hollywood uh, or the I'm sorry the um, Toronto like Dome Theater. You know those domes yeah. in there. Yeah. And they had a special viewing of uh, Blade Runner. Thomas Jane. Did I call him Miller? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and we went and watched. Blade Runner, and it was a phenomenal, phenomenal. Are you experience. talking about when we all went to watch both Blade Runners back to back? No, no. Oh, okay, I did. I right. didn't enjoy that one, by the way. Yeah, I didn't enjoy it. It was too crowded. It was hot, and uh, and the the second one, anyway. No, and yeah. by but this one was they just did a special viewing. And by gotcha. the way, I got to that one late, and I only saw the second one. I don't know if they showed the, but this one we went. And it was a special viewing of the one, and and I really, really enjoyed that. But probably the most I enjoyed. Blade Runner was last night uh, when I watched it to get ready for this. And I watched it at a private theater. The sound was great. And I, I go back and I remember how, when I first came across this movie. So again, it kind of goes back to the conversation that you and I were having with uh, They Live, where there's kind of a movie in the atmosphere, but there's no way to get a hold of that movie. And you hear about it and everything. Yeah. And then I remember going to the video store and going and seeing the Blade Runner cover. And this was after, like, this was probably a few years after Blade Runner was coming out. So there was, like, no, there was nothing around it that made it interesting or anything like that. But I saw fucking Han Solo, like, yep. with, with his coat blowing with in the, the wind. With a trench coat. He, with a trench coat. And he has two guns, like, firing and looking the other way. And I'm like, how the fuck do I not know this movie? Yep. Like, where did this movie come from? And then it hit me. When I see this, like, oh, this is that movie that I just see little snippets and everything. And I remember, it's funny, I don't remember my name or where I live or my kids' names, but I remember almost everything I've ever seen. And I remember there was a Harrison Ford special, like on, you know, on a, on a Saturday night or something. where It was just kind of like a, a, a snippet. Maybe he had a movie coming out, but it was like a, a story of Harrison Ford, how he got started and everything like that. And then there was some, they were like, and then he did Blade Runner. Like, it was like Star Wars. Indiana Jones, like an hour on that, and then, oh, and Blade Runner, and then moving on, right? And then I just remember, like, wait, what, what's that Blade Runner shit? And you can see there was a little bit of behind the scenes, really Scott and whatever. So I rented the movie, but what's interesting is I don't remember my first experience uh, watching the movie. What I remember is just always catching glimpses of it on HBO or whenever it would come on, and I would always sit down and watch it. And I don't know how I felt about it the first time I watched it, but I do know I was always interested in it. I always wanted to know more about it. And I don't imagine I would have liked it too much because this is 1982, right? So this is a few years after Han Solo and one year after Indiana Jones. And the thing about this movie, and you and I talk about this at length, and I guess what we'll do is we'll zoom out and I'll give one yeah. overview of my and overall we can dive into opinion the of it, and then we can zoom back in. Yeah. So, what, so like, I'm going to read the text crawl real quick. Okay, so Blade Runner starts off, boom, has that bass. I know you love a good text crawl. I love and, a good text crawl. <laughs> you know me and a text crawl, man. So it says, early in the 21st century, the Tyrell Corporation advanced robot evolution into the nexus phase, a being virtually identical to a human known as a replicant. The nexus six replicants were superior in strength and agility and at least equal in intelligence to the genetic engineers who created them. Replicants were used off-world as slave labor in the hazardous exploration and colonization of other planets. After a bloody mutiny by a Nexus 6 combat team in an off-world colony, replicants were declared illegal on Earth under penalty of death. Special police squads, Blade Runner units, had orders to shoot to kill upon detection any trespassing replicant. This was not called an execution. It was called a retirement. Now, here is what I think bumped me about this movie, right? That fucking text crawl... It's like in, um, I always like to say in Harlem Nights when she's like, I got my mouth all ready for some orange juice. And, yep. and you you left a swallow in the container. And he's like, shut up, bitch. But that's kind of like, but it was like, you read that text crawl. And it's like, these fucking combat units of, of replicants are doing things. And then fucking Han Solo and Indiana Jones shows up on screen. And it gets your mouth all, and then this is 1982, right after Star Wars. So it's like, in that realm where there's all those Star Wars derivatives of movies that were coming yep. out, coming out. But now you got fucking Han Solo. 
Your and mouth was all ready for some Harrison Ford. <laughs> my mouth was all my mouth was all ready for some Harrison Ford. Yeah. And he shows up and Brian's like, We need you, buddy. We need the Blade Runner. We need that magic. And you're like, oh, he's a bad motherfucker. Right. And then he commenced to getting his ass kicked through the whole fucking movie. Yes. Now, I think I bumped against that, but I was still fascinated, right? This movie was like airlifted from another time and put in 1982 when these movies weren't there, and it was too sophisticated for us to understand it. This is a deeply um, existential, asking deep philosophical questions it's about what it means film. to be. It's a noir film. But something, in my perspective, changed last night when I watched it. And what I realized, because I, I uh, started reading about that you know, the debate of Decker, is Decker a replicant or is he not a replicant? But I watched it as knowing from the beginning that he's a replicant and everything fell into place. And what I realized is, is that the cops at the time had a prejudice against replicants. And Decker even tried to adopt that. You know, he would call it it and that and act as if he was like that. And what I realized is, is that Bryant and Gaffed they're just fucking with, with, with Decker. And when he comes in, he's like, ah, oh, you know, we need the play. But I see, he's, looking at, uh, he's looking at Edward James almost. Like when he walks in, they're kind of looking at each other. And when Edward James, Mo and we're going to get into it, but this is the zoom out view. But when, Ed, uh, when Gaff goes to get Harrison Ford and he's eating noodles, Gaff gives him a bump, like a slap, like a, like a, boot, like a, like a, you know, a bump like in high school, like a little slap. Like, yeah. And he sees him and, he sit, and then he brings him in. You realize... I, I look at this like, they're just fucking with him. You're the bat. And it's like, no, it's fucking dangerous. Just like when they send them to do off-world shit and everything, and the other guy that was hunting Blade Runners, he's breathing on a respirator. So they're like, send in fucking Decker. And he's not that great at his job. And it, I'm just saying, this is my personal take. Yep. You can come in and, and, and this is, but this made this movie great because the consistency, I mean, he's okay. You know, he found the snake scale and the, and everything, but he gets his ass kicked through the whole movie, which then makes me also more sympathetic to his character. And I don't want to jump too far, but even when he shoots Zora in the back, and we're going to get into a deep, and then Bryant comes back and is like, "Hey, follow this guy, Gaffed. He's a he's a one man killing machine, you know, and all that stuff." And it's like, no, he kind of fucked up. He's shooting in the crowd of people. He's bumping in. He's falling. There's nothing about him that's that's like Harrison Ford, or Indiana Jones. So he, I was no, like, he's oh. not he's not the action hero version. He's the noir detective. Version. Yeah. Well, he's not the Humphrey Bogart version. Humphrey Bogart he's, got his ass kicked all the time. Humphrey Bogart was always one step ahead. He was always clever. Like like uh, Harrison Ford would have been murdered if it, it wasn't him. It yeah. was the people walking in in the first thing. Rucker Howard saved him at the end. So it's not, you know, all I'm saying is my viewing experience really, like, it was probably, once I let go of him being Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones and watching right. it as if for the first time, I thoroughly enjoyed yeah. the movie on another yeah. level. If, if, if you, I agree. If you want to watch a movie where Harrison Ford kicks ass, this is not that movie. But yeah, we, we can get into it, but I, I have a different theory about what's going on here. And in fact, the Blade Runner 2049 movie did away with that. That retconned that whole Deckard is a replicant out. It's gone now. Because the whole thing in Blade Runner 2049, spoilers if you haven't seen that movie, is that Deckard and Rachel had a kid, and it was the first time that a replicant and a human had a kid together. So Deckard is definitely a human. But anyway. I think Ridley Scott... Wants him to be a replicant, and I think, I think Harrison Scott Ford does want him to be a replicant. <laughs> I think Harrison Ford is like, "What is this unicorn shit that you got yeah. me dreaming in this yeah. director's cut? This is bullshit. Where'd you get this off Legend? You get this fucking thing off? Like, I'm not a replicant. God damn it! Don't put those halos in my eyes. The fuck are you doing? All right, so let's let's dive into the movie itself. So I I, I so Blade Runner is is a sci-fi noir film in the classic version of noir. It is a detective who is uh, burned out. He's he's he no longer is acting as a detective. He no longer has that job. Uh, and and they come to him to do one last job. It's the one last job noir film, right? It's like we know you want to get out, but you got to do this one last thing for us before you get out. And they kind of strong arm him into it because there's the scene where the police chief who's trying to bring him back in says, 
you know the score. If you're not cops, you're little people. Basically a threat saying, if you're not one of us, we can do whatever we want to you. Which is a lovely clue about the world that Blade Runner takes place in. And, and this is part of my theory on it is, is why Deckard gets his ass kicked and all that stuff. Is the world that Blade Runner takes place in is a world in decline. It is a failing world. It is rotting and decaying and falling apart everywhere. So the cops have way too much power, right? You know, Brian says, you're not a cop. You're little people like threatening him. Uh, there's a scene later where a cop comes and says, what are you doing here? He says, I'm working. What are you doing? And the cop says, I'm arresting you. Got no probable cause to arrest him. It's just cops just have unlimited power in this world, which is a thing you see in sort of these collapsing societies, right? Every building that we go in is falling apart. It's all decaying. All the, you know, you, the buildings when you show them from outside have these big scaffoldings up the side to keep them from falling over. It's always raining. There's tons of people in the street. None of the people in the street seem to have anywhere to go. It's just like the streets are filled with people that seem aimless. They don't have jobs. They don't have stuff to do. You know, people, people buy artificial pets to give themselves something to take care of rather than take care of real things. You never see children. There's no children in this world. So it is, it is a dying, decaying world. And that is the ultimate dark noir sort of conceit of the, of the collapsing world, of the decaying world, that our detective is going to have to crawl through the muck of this decaying world in order to solve the case. Such a good noir setup. And so he gets pulled back in, and the case is to find and kill five of these replicants who escaped and are running around on Earth. So take one step back, though. The yep. opening shot, as they're coming in, you hear the Van Gaalis score for the first time, yep. is like breathtaking. It's that's breathtaking. The thing, that's yep. the thing that pulled me in. And yep. then it says Los Angeles 2019, because yep. you think they're flying over hell. And there's yes. just fireballs blowing out. And one of the things that Ridley Scott said that was important to him is that once you get, like, this is a, like you said, this is a future that's in decay. And they're not tearing down and building new buildings. That's right. What they're doing is they're fortifying the old ones and then building and adding to it. Yeah. And so the they're buildings just slapping in stuff over the surface. Right. Slapping. Yeah. And so the, all the buildings in Los Angeles are taller and bigger, but they're, run down and and terrible looking and there's these gas balls and blowing and everything and in the book and i don't know if it's if it's clear in the movie but this is post world war three and there's a name for it i don't remember in the book and there's you know it's the atmosphere is very toxic the rain is very toxic it's it's a, a, a cesspool and then the Terrell pyramid is the tallest biggest building in and it's the city. beautiful it's and gleaming. it's beautiful and pristine. It's, clean. it's the only clean thing in the city is this big building for the Trail Corporation. Yeah, all of that stuff is true. And, and, and uh, you were telling your story about the first time you saw this movie. So I knew about the movie because um, I, when it came out and they were showing ads for it, I really wanted to see it. When there was ads on TV, you know, um, the ad for Blade Runner I thought was awesome as a kid. I was like, I got to see that. And, of course, it was R-rated. And so my parents were like, you can't see that. It's R-rated. But I found out my mother snuck out to see it. I told you about this because Harry no, had Harrison you didn't Ford. Tell me. Yeah, I did. I told you. I told you that they would like she would never watch R-rated movies, but the movie she oh yeah you did she tell me about Harrison Ford. For, yeah, yeah. She got she had to go see Blade Runner, right? Yeah. And we had we talked about it a little bit, right? She told me a little bit about it, so I was it only whetted my appetite more. I really wanted to see this, and I remember. So, did you ever have a paper route as a kid? No. Okay, so I had a paper route as a kid, and. Um, one of the things you do when you have a paper route is once a month, you have to go to all your customers and, and collect the money. And so once a month, I'd have to go to all hundred and some people that were on my paper route and have them give me, you know, like the kid from a, a better up to $2. I want my $2. I was that guy. I was doing, uh, give me my $2. So while I was doing that, and, and if you're, if you've ever had a paper route and if you've been that age, you know what I'm talking about. There are people who will try to talk to and some of them are just nice. They're like nice old ladies or nice old guys who just like, they, they don't talk to anybody. So when the paper boy comes by, they want to chat with you or whatever. And that's fine. And if you talk to them long enough, they give you a good tip. So, you know, that's fine. But then there's the people who want to talk to you. You get a little uncomfortable, right? We're like the guy who li clearly lives alone and he just wants to keep you at the door and keep chatting. Don't you sit up. in my lap, little kitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. There's then there's those guys. You're just trying to get out of there as quickly right. as possible. And right. I, I had a guy in my paper who was that guy. Mm-hmm. He had he lived by himself in this shitty little apartment. Every time I would go collect, well, you know, he'd he'd open the I don't think he had a job because he was always home. He'd open the door and he'd want to keep me at that door as long as possible. He'd just keep talking to me. And he'd ask me like really personal questions, like you, you know, you got a girlfriend, you know, that kind of stuff. It was it was weird. One time I went there, I go to collect, I knock on the door, he opens it up. And the beginning of Blade Runner was playing on the TV behind him, you know, with the city that you're talking about, with the city, the text call, and then the city with the, and the eye, you know, the zoom in on the eye. That's all playing behind him. I stood and talked to that dude for 20 minutes just so I could watch Blade Runner behind him. Like, I wasn't listening to anything he said. I was just watching the TV behind him. And once I had seen that, I was like, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. I have to see this movie. So I, I, I had a friend who had HBO and was playing on HBO, which is why it was on that guy's TV. I'm like, dude, the next time Blade Runner's on TV, I don't care if it's 3 o'clock in the fucking morning, I'm coming to your house, we're watching Blade Runner, don't tell my parents, we're just making that happen. And that's what I wound up doing. I wound up going to my friend uh, Calvin's house. We, we had like 2 o'clock in the morning, Blade Runner came on, and that's the first time I watched it. And he included that eye just as like a visual uh, Orwellian kind of call of like the big brothers watching. Yes. That there's a power, there's a, there's a, a unified power that's kind of controlling everything. And, and it's a cop. It's, it's the cop's eye. Yeah. That it, so it's the police are watching you. Which leads, uh, and then, so that's my first time watching it. Which leads into that fantastic opening scene with the, with the brilliant and sadly no longer with us and greatly missed Brian James sitting there being interviewed by the cop who's asking him all those really strange questions while that strange little device is like breathing in the back or breathing on the table. You know, it's got the weird sort of breathing apparatus and it's got the camera pointed at his eye. Fantastic scene because you don't know what's happening. Like you don't understand what's happening. You got these two guys sitting there. One of them is clearly interviewing the other one. He's asking them all kinds of crazy questions like, you know, you're walking through the desert and you see a tortoise and you kick the tortoise over and you're not helping it. Why aren't you helping it? And clearly the Brian James character, the other character is getting more and more and more agitated. And we, and we as the audience have no idea what the fuck this is, right? We're like, what is happening right now? Why is he asking him all these weird ass questions? And it ends with the great line of tell me only the good things you remember about your mother. And Brian James just leans across the table and goes, my mother let me tell you about my mother and then blows him away, shoots him right through the table, right? Such a fantastic open because the scene, the two great actors playing off of each other in this weird, dark, smoky room with this weird device, all these very strange questions. And it ends with this moment of shocking violence. And if you're watching the movie and you're not fully in by the end of that scene, I don't understand anybody who isn't like watch that scene and go, holy shit, I need to know everything from now on. You know, if, if, you're a, if you're an actor or an aspiring actor and you're watching, you want to see some really great work, Brian James is terrific in this scene. And yes. one of the things that is the trap of this scene is you will see, I've seen this scene many times, and the actor will play the end of the scene at the front of the scene. And Brian James' intention is in the scene is he is suspicious. He knows this guy wants something. And he doesn't trust him. And so his intention with every question is like, why is he asking me what a tortoise is? And then why is he, is he smug? Is he doing, and each thing has a different dimension. And as he's figuring out, and then when he gets that final trigger with the mother, then it's fucking on and he blows him through the thing. And it's so menacing. It's so sinister because Brian James is a plant. He's a plant in there to get to Terrell. So he has that going through. Now, most people will play the end of that scene. They call it playing the end of the scene where they come up and they're like, oh, I'm cagey. I'm, I'm really, you know, and they don't have a clear intention. And it's just like my intention is just to act like I'm, I'm crazy and I got crazy eyes and I'm stressed. And that's all indicating. And it's all, whereas like if you play the discovery in each yeah. question, then it's co- so compelling to watch and it yeah. draws you in. And, it, and he plays it in a way there's some real, like, I agree with what you're saying. There's some really subtle acting here. And one of the things that Brian James plays it is he think you think that the Brian James character thinks the other guy's making fun of him, right? Like, he plays it like a not super smart guy who thinks a smart guy is making fun of him. You can read the scene that way. 
it's only at the end when you realize, oh, no, that's not what was happening. He was just really suspicious and he was playing at KG. It came across as a dumb guy thinking a smart guy's making fun of him, but that's not at all what was happening. And that's the subtlety of that performance. That he leads you the wrong direction with his performance until you get to the end and you go, oh, shit, I understand what was happening now. Yeah, it's really well done. And Brian James, I mean, we, we all miss him. He was a fantastic, fantastic character actor. Uh, didn't get nearly enough credit while he was alive. I, 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 I really miss him showing up in movies. We talked about him last week on 48 yeah. Hours. You know, That's right. He comes in. He's just, and, you know, I, like if this was the rewatchables and they, like, they have this award, like who steals the show or like who is this, like he would be up for it because he's really good in this. Yep. In such a small role. And now we're into the movie. You know, we have the scene where, where Deckard, who is played by Harrison Ford, is recruited. Um, you get the sense that he is an ex-cop that has quit the force. And the cops show up and say, hey, you need to come back. We've got, he was, he was a Blade Runner. He was one of the cops whose job it is to hunt down and kill replicants that get on Earth. And they have five of the most advanced replicants. The, the Nexus 6, the latest model, the one that's indistinguishable from humans. They've got five of these running around in New York, and they need to be hired. And so they, they pull him back in, and they send him out on the job. So now you've got the classic noir story of the burned-out detective, doesn't want to do the job, and is forced into one last job. And in this case, the last job is murdering five seemingly human beings. And what I got from... This rewatching is that he does have this prejudice against the replicants, but I think that the killing of these replicants are taking a toll. Yeah. And so when he comes in, he says, I was quit before I came in here, and now I'm twice as quit. Yep. And um, there's a, a, the noir world weariness and... Yes. Of, of him being a part of this thing. And this guy's, we need you. We need the magic. And, and I, 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 I think you and I will, will continue this beta. We go further. I think he's a replicant. I, I listen, I think I listen to Ridley Scott because here's the, like, even, and we'll go yeah, through. But Ridley he, Scott also thinks this takes place in the same universe as Alien. So well, I don't know I if mean, he can be trusted on this stuff. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and I could, you know, I could probably argue against that, but I just think, it makes sense, particularly with this cut, on many different levels, and they tip it off many, many different times. You know, he has the attachment to the Polaroids and the pictures and the memories that they do. The fact that he has that dream of with the unicorn, and then at the end, uh, Gaff yeah, leaves. That the was unicorn. that was a retcon, though. That was that was that was a re- well. The unicorn yeah. was always there, but the the memory was not there. That came yes. in after the fact. That's right. So you got to look at like what is canon. If Ridley Scott is George Lucas in uh, the Blade Runner universe, and he, I, he, an interview was uh, with, when they were talking about 2024, how uh, Rachel got pregnant, and he was like, yeah, she's a replicant, and her reproductive uh, parts work, which means that could also be possible for the, for the male. And that... Anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll get into that as we as we come come across it. But it makes it makes the movie more interesting to me because I was always watching from the point of view that he wasn't a replicant, and I had way more empathy, and I was moved by him more. And I think the reason Rucker Howard saves him at the end is that he sees this replicant that has no idea that he is, and he's still struggling for life. See, just I like read Rucker all Howard's of those scenes very different. Okay, and, we'll, we'll, and we'll get the, to him. And the the. And I probably used to read them like you did. The reason I spent the early part talking about how this is a fallen world, this paying world, is because even the things that are good in this world aren't good. So, like, Deckard might actually be the best blade earner, but that doesn't mean he's like an action hero badass, because nothing in this world is action hero badass. Everything is a piece of shit in this world. So even the people who are good at their jobs are kind of shitty. Well, Rucker Howard's an action hero badass. Yes, but Rucker Howard is one is is the is the Superman. He is the he is the created being. Is the next evolution of humans created by humans to replace them in sort of the the philosophical version of this, right? So he's the God Man. He is the perfected human, and that's why he's so dangerous. That's why he's so scary. But given all of that, you know that that Deckard is pulled back into this thing and forced into it 
that's another sign of this sort of fallen world thing that that he doesn't want to do the thing and the police have this power to force him to do it by threatening him you know if the police come to your house and say you need to come work for us at the cops you can go no i don't want to be a fucking cop and the cops can't go yeah well if you're not a cop we're going to come fuck you up like they're not allowed to do that in this world they are Mm -hmm. (laughs) in this world they're totally allowed to just say if you don't come work for us we're going to come fuck you up Right. I mean, in this country, maybe, but I think if you're in Russia, or if you're in Russia, like that, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're like, okay, yeah, you're uh, lucky if you're a cop in Russia because then they're not throwing you out on the front lines in Ukraine to get chewed up. Oh, fuck. so Decker ends up going to Tyrell Corporation. They want to run the test on Nexus Six. Now, do they want to run the test on Nexus Six just to basically test the test because these they, are the newest they models? Do. So they they so uh, there's a bit of subterfuge here. So the cops are told that there is a Nexus 6 at Tyrell that they can test the device on the Voight-Comp device, which is the only device the cops have for telling a replicant from a human. And the only way they can tell a replicant from a human is by measuring emotional responses, right? Because the replicants don't have fully developed emotional lives. So they're such perfect copies of humans that only the fact that they don't have emotional, fully developed emotional lives is the giveaway. So they're going to test this device on, on this replicant. What Tyrell does is he, he, does a little, he does a little subterfuge here. He says, I want you to test it on a human. I want to see the test work on a human. Then I'll give you a replicant to test it on, and I want to see the difference between the two. And he's lying because he gives Deckard Rachel, who is a Nexus 6 replicant, and convinces Deckard that she's a person, so that he's testing her as if she's a human using the test that's supposed to find replicants. And the result of it is he does eventually figure out that she's a replicant, but it takes him much longer. You know, he says like it, it took you like twice as long, twice as many questions. A hundred questions. Yeah. Where twice it usually as many. takes 20 to 30. Yeah. Right. Right. And so it took way more questions to, to suss her out because what Tyrell is doing, what we discover is they are taking these replicants who basically are born as adults, right? You know, they, you, you create this replicant. It's, 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 it was never a child. And then they give them fake memories of having been children. And in that way, they give them an emotional past that a replicant doesn't normally have. And that's what makes them harder to detect. And if you sit and think about that for a second, it's kind of terrifying. I mean, like this watch this one time, and, and when he says that I think Rachel's beginning to suspect, could you imagine like everything, every memory that you have with Janae, everything like, you know, all the stuff that you, you know, and people showed up and were like, sorry, dude, you're a replicant. You'd be like, fuck you. I'm a replicant. Like I grew up here. I was in this religious cult. Like I, you know, fuck, you know, and all this. And- I think, I think I would deal with that better than most people. Cause I'm not <laughs> sentimental. So I'd be like, you, you, really? I'm, I'm a super strong, super agile robot. <laughs> fuck yeah. That so sounds you, amazing. What you would probably do is you'd probably be like, yeah, that makes more sense to yeah, me. Yeah, I, I get it now. Yeah, I get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I don't give a shit about people. So, yeah, like, okay, yeah, no, I got it. I got it. That makes- yeah, okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I understand what I'm supposed to be doing now. But see, that's 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 part of my problem with the whole, and this this scene sort of illuminates this. And part of my problem with the whole Deckard is a replicant thing is is the core for me, and this is just me speaking. So I'm not saying anybody who disagrees with this is wrong. I'm just saying my view. The core emotional story of Blade Runner is Deckard reached a point where he couldn't shoot these artificial people anymore. Something about it was affecting him deeply emotionally, right? And he had to quit. He had to stop doing it. And I think the thing that the movie keeps saying, at least the Deckard is not a replicant movie, is is the ways in which we are drawing an artificial distinction between these replicants and actual people. It, that that distinction is is a distinction without a difference, if you're familiar with that. And Mm -hmm. when Deckard is obsessed with his pictures, when he's going through his pictures, that's not telling me that he's a replicant. It's telling me that he's a human and humans look through pictures. And the fact that the replicants like pictures and look through them just is making them more human, right? So every time, so, so people look at those scenes and they go, oh, this is a sign that Deckard is a replicant. I see those scenes and I see the opposite. I see this is a sign that the replicants are people. They're humans. And we've drawn this artificial distinction to keep them off world or whatever, make, keep them slaves. Basically, to keep them slaves, we have decided that they're not human so that we can enslave them. But everything about them 
every time there's a similarity between Deckard and them, I'm just going, this is the movie saying these guys are people. And that's why Deckard got to a point where he couldn't shoot them. When the only way to tell the difference between the enslaved person that you're allowed to kill at will and your children is that they have slightly different emotional responses. And the only way to detect that is with a special machine to detect slightly different emotional responses. Maybe you shouldn't be shooting those people. Maybe they're just people. It, but the only, the only reason they have slightly different emotional responses is because in reality, they're like three years old. They're four years right. old. Exactly. And so they haven't fully under, really fully developed or understood how to yep. process those. Yes. It, you know, and I think Rucker Howard does an excellent job. Like when, when Pris dies and he's like, um, yeah. or when he tells Pris that Leon died and he's like, and it's yeah. like, he's like, he feels something and he's trying to like emote, yep. but he doesn't really know how it's like a, you know, like a three-year-old would, would handle that. And, and they're very childlike when we get to the scene where they are dealing with the guy who makes the eyes. Yeah. You're next to six, right? I make your eyes. You know, when they get to that scene. The way they interact with him is very childlike. You know, when he's taking the eyes out of the thing and, and putting eyes on him and, and just like, that's the kind of thing a child does, right? It's not, it's not a thing a grown up does. And, and it really reinforces the child and, and Pris's interactions with Sebastian, very childlike, right? I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I think the only difference is that these people haven't had time to develop emotional lives yet, you know, which is part of what they're replacing with the artificial memories. But the argument of the movie to me is the replicants are people and we shouldn't be enslaving them and we shouldn't be killing them. And, that's the, and that is the core uh, difficulty that Deckard was dealing with emotionally. That's what kicked him out of the force. He just couldn't keep shooting these things because they were just starting to seem like people. And there's the, you know, after he shoots Zora and he says, you know, I, I, I got her, but I, all I could feel was that I had just shot a woman in the back. right? That it's yeah. that it's and, and when you make Deckard a replicant, you steal that idea out of the movie. Well, and, and I, I think, don't like that. I feel so like the, the much stronger idea no, is the I, replicants I, are people idea. No, but the, to me, that's look, the thing about Decker is like his life is a blank slate. He lives in this dark apartment. There's no history to him. There's no backstory to him. He clings to these photos. She says to Decker, have you taken the test? He hasn't taken the test. His eyes glow. Now, I know. There's a lot of Ridley Scott putting in that he's a Decker, that he is a replicant, but I feel as if the story makes more sense, and we'll get to each situation from that. But in terms of like the childlike uh, attachment, like Leon is so attached to those pictures. Now, this is one thing that I had to really look closely at. Decker ends up getting taking the address that, that um, Leon was saying in the, uh, in the test, and he goes to Leon's apartment to search for for clues and see what he can find. That's when yeah. he finds the scale in the bathtub, but he finds Leon's pictures yep. and Leon is there looking through the window because he was going back for those pictures. There's an emotional yep. attachment to pictures. Now what kind of bumped me at first is Terrell talks about how Rachel is a new experiment and he embedded these memories into her. So then that will then help her develop emotionally uh, a lot faster if she has these memories to kind of hang on. So then I thought, and then so all the pictures are pictures from his niece. All her memories are memories for his niece. So then I got confused about Leon's pictures and his memories. And what I realized is, is Leon's pictures are all real. It's all pictures in his short life of the people that are his family and his friends who are Roy Batty and... Uh, Zora uh, and and Chris and you know that's how he finds it so when uh, what's interesting is that he puts their mission at risk to go back for those pictures that's why when we meet Roy Batty for the first time he comes out and goes did you get your silly little pictures no, <laughs> you know, did you like get you, your precious photos oh did you get your precious photos and he says you know there was men in the apartment he goes police Men, yeah, <laughs> says, yeah I love please. that whole scene. Did you get your so, precious photos? Can we just talk about Rugger Howard for a while? Like, yeah, he fills this movie with star power. He is so interesting as an actor. He has such a presence, and his choices are brilliant yeah. and rooted and connected to an, a character and expression. You get that this guy is a three-year-old homicidal 
maniac who doesn't want to be a homicidal maniac. He just wants to be human, but he doesn't know how. He's been programmed for this thing. And he does it so beautifully and so well. He's so compelling, you can't take your eyes off of him. And I think about like this little run he had with doing this movie and Lady Hawk and uh, was it is it Nighthawk with with Sylvester Stallone? Yeah, um, where he plays the where he yeah. plays the uh, terrorist. Yeah, the terrorist, and he has these yeah. things. And I I think like you go back and look at his IMDb, and he's like, and you're like, did he have agents? Like, what? Yeah. Why was he taking these fucking jobs? And uh, he was already doing Blind Fury, Blind Fury in 1989, which is just a not too long past this. And even though you and I love Blind Fury, it's not a great movie. And it's not worthy of his talents because he even did The Hitcher right after this. And he was fucking terrifying in The Hitcher. He was terrifying in The Hitcher. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, dude, if this guy would have made different choices. I don't know what happened because. Could have been Jack Nicholson. He had a fantastic run where he was doing really interesting work. And then I don't know if, if his agents convinced him to do it or he thought it was the right thing to do. Tried to become an action movie star. He did that movie with Gene Simmons, uh, was it Dead or Alive, Wanted Dead or Alive, something like that, where he plays a bounty hunter going after uh, a guy, and, and, and it, he tried to transition to this sort of action movie version. He did a movie with Kim Cattrall set in the future where he's hunting a monster through the canals um, of London, I guess, or New York, whatever it was supposed to be, and it wrecked his career. You know, it, it, he... He went from a really interesting, very respected actor to a bad action movie guy. And it, and it threw his entire career off path, which is such a bummer because he had, he had such a strong run here that he could have turned into something amazing. So I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what convinced him to try the other path. I don't know if it was guys were showing up with dump trucks full of money going, hey, come star in our movie, and he yeah. just didn't know any better. Yeah, um, and he was doing like, 10 movies a year you know yeah. it's like yeah. dude be a little bit more selective like you know slow down maybe it's because i don't know i don't know but be, you, maybe but you look you work in hollywood you know that there there is a trap agents like to make money and the way they make money is if you work because they get a chunk cut of your money right mm-hmm. and so they're always pushing you to work as much as possible for the highest dollar amount you can get because that's what pays them yeah and you only have one you but they have a hundred you so if, you, if your career fails, that sucks for you because now you don't have a career, but they got 99 more of you waiting in the magazine. Mm-hmm. So they can, they can wreck your career to make the most money off, off of you in the shortest amount of time. And mm-hmm. if you fail, well, they, mm-hmm. they got more guys. They'll just mm-hmm. switch to one of the other guys, right? Yeah. And so for an actor, it's very important to have some, some, some say, some judgment about which things you take and which things you don't and you don't just let your agents tell you what to do, right because they just don't always make the best choices for their clients and if you're not doing that if you don't have some agency and take and make some decisions it's very easy to get pushed down the wrong path for short-term gains which your agent will love because mm-hmm. they're getting they're getting paid right mm-hmm. at, at the sacrifice of long-term gain. right and, and you know that because I know that you are very smart at curating your career. We've talked about that. Like, you know, you've been offered things where your agent's like, hey, you should do this. And you're like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that. I think that's going the wrong direction. I think, I think that takes me down a path I don't want to go down. But that shows that you're thinking about it. You have some agency. You, you know, you have some control over the choices that your career is making. Right. But you have to do that. And I, and I wonder if Rutger didn't do that. Yeah. So Rutger and Leon... They show up at Choose, James Hong, who's like one, one of my favorite 80s. Like oh, my God. We, you got, we love yeah, this guy. Yeah, yeah. I love this He's guy. Amazing. Big Trouble in Little China, you know, all over. He, there. there was this great article in the LA Times about him. Like, there was like a big, long article about how many movies yeah. he's done, how present he's been like in Hollywood. a thousand. He's done like a thousand movies. A thousand movies. He was, he was showing up in old episodes of Kung Fu in the 70s. Wow. Like you watch Kung Fu, James Hong is in there. You're like, oh my God, yeah, there's the guy. He's already doing stuff. So we find out what Roy Batty and uh, Leon are after, and they're trying to figure out how to reverse this genetic death alarm. Yeah, because there's on this them. clock, this ticking clock. Yeah, you get and five years and then you just die. Now, one thing I'm confused about was Chu. So he said, I just specialize in the eyes, right? I'm just focused on the yeah. eyes. I'm not. 
Was this like a bootleg operation of creating eyes? Like, was he connected to the Tyrell yeah. agency? Yeah, he, he was, he's, he was, corporation. he was the guy who designed the eye. So why the fuck was he not working in the pyramid? That massive fucking pyramid where they're constructing, like, why was he working in this you know, building? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Tyrell uses subcontractors, right? Like every big company uses subcontractors. But like, eyes are kind like, of important. Like, and maybe, yeah. You know, the, the, the people who make the F-22 don't make AMRAMs, right? Mm-hmm. So. So, you know, Tyrell's making, making replicants, but, you know, they, they got a, a, a guy that does the design for the eyes. They got a guy who does the design for the heart. They got a guy who does the design for the fingernails, right? Like, you have, you have subcontractors who are contributing pieces to this. Uh, that's the way I saw it, is he's just the guy who did the design on right. the eyes. But he probably does eye design for lots of companies. Yeah. He did it for Tyrell, but he also probably does it for other people, too. What a great art design of him just being in this freezer, and he's got the, all these tubes hanging off all randomly yeah, to keep all over the warm. place. To yeah, keep the like, warm air on him and yeah. everything. And yeah. they rip it off of him, and he's asking him questions. And you're right. He's like, there, there is a bit of a childlike where they're, just, they're balancing eyes on his, on his shoulders yeah. as they're, they're talking to him and going through what it is. My question is, they're trying to figure out this code or whatever, but... What's interesting to me is how offended they get when they're talked. So he basically says, oh, are you Nexus 6? I created your eyes. Yeah. And he's like, the things that I've seen with your eyes. Your eyes. But it's a little bit like, <laughs> yeah. like that's, that's when you know he's going to die. And like if somebody belittled you in a way of like, oh, you were created. They're just reminding you that you're a creation because they feel like they're fully formed human beings that have the right to live, yeah. you know? And so there's this certain thing that kind of violates that. I, 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 that is certainly a valid interpretation of that. I also think the James Hong character there is excited to meet them because... Mm-hmm. Oh, Nexus he is. Six, yes. Nexus 6 is the most advanced replicant ever made. He got to work on it he probably never actually saw a replicant because they're not allowed mm-hmm. to be on earth. Right. So they're he's there. Clearly and he's like, oh. excited. Yeah. yeah. He's like, Oh man, I work, I worked on you. It's like, it's like, you know, but you go to, I the, don't think they took. So they, yes. Yeah. yeah they, they, yeah. yes, they got what he was excited about, but it's like, Oh yeah, I made your eyes. Like, Oh, you're yeah. the, yeah, I did this. Look, it, I, that's so cool. I made your eyes. And he's like, the things I've seen with your eyes, which is a great line. I mean, Rutger Hauer is just a great line machine in this movie. It's just nonstop great lines. Yeah. If only you could see what I've seen, your eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. So there are, there are some world-building issues that create some plot holes. I didn't notice them until about the third or fourth time I'd seen the movie. But one of them shows up here, which is, they're like, the Nexus 6 is so advanced, it's only detectable with the Voight-Kampf test, right? Really? I think it's detectable if I pour some uh, liquid nitrogen on his arm and he doesn't freeze. He's a yeah. Nexus 6. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then later when Pris sticks her hand in the boiling pot and takes out the yeah. egg, yeah. I'm like, easy test for Nexus 6. I, I, I'd put a little drop of boiling uh, water on your skin. If you don't blister, you're a Nexus 6. <laughs> or why don't you just shine a light in their eyes <laughs> and see the, the halo in their eyes? You know, it's like instead of asking them 100 fucking questions, stick their hand in a fire or shine yeah. a light in their eyes and see yep. it like the halo reflect. You don't even need to you. stick it in a fire. You just take a little dropper with some uh, liquid nitrogen, drop it on the skin. If they're not a Nexus 6, they will get a blister. <laughs> exactly. That's all you we- need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, um, I, I had that same problem with Battlestar Galactica when they're like, the, the, the humanoid Cylons are totally indetectable. I'm like, really? All you got to do is excite them and their spine lights up. That means they're not exactly like humans. <laughs> Because right. humans don't have <laughs> spines that light up when they're excited. <laughs> right. So they learn about J.F. Sebastian through yeah. Chew. I love Sebastian. I do, too. Yeah. I don't think we're there home yet, Home again, though. home again, jiggity jig. Yeah, I think Good we got Good evening. We have to talk about Rachel visiting uh, Decker before we move on to that. Yep. Now, it's interesting because this whole storyline fascinates me, and it fascinates me more this last time I watched it than it has in the past. The fact that she has no idea that she's a replicant, maybe she suspects, but there's almost an insecurity about it. And she goes to his apartment to say, you think I'm a replicant, you're wrong. And here's my memories, and here's this, and here's that. And then he is so callous and so cold to her. And then her reaction of like being devastated but not trying, doesn't wanting to show it, it's heartbreaking. 
It is. And it makes me think of, um, people will talk about the callous sort of racism that is displayed by soldiers when they're in countries where you're at war. You know, like you, you watch like uh, Generation Kill and the Marines are all calling the Iraqis you know, ragheads or towelheads or whatever, right? There's just that, that callous racism. But I understand the emotional need for it. The emotional need is I might have to kill these people. So if I, if I see them as humans just like me, that will make it much harder for me to pull the trigger when I have to. And I think that's part of what we're seeing here is, is Deckard knows he, if he's around a replicant, he might have to kill that replicant. And if he allows himself to see her as a person, it just makes it harder for him to pull the trigger, right? And I think there's that. I think that, that, that callousness toward her and toward the other replicants is the same thing you see with soldiers, the callousness towards the people that you might have to kill. That it's an it's emotional protection. It's like, I don't want to kill somebody that I think of as human because that will really fuck me up. So I have to not think of you as human so that if I do have to kill you, I'm protected. I, it feels very similar to me. Is, and then we get to Sebastian. Yeah, so and there's the very awkward beginning of the romance with uh, Harrison Ford and, and Rachel, with Deckard and Rachel, which... Uh, oh, but they don't uh, hook up this time. No, they don't, but it's the beginning of, it's the it's beginning the beginning. of the romance. I don't... Yes. Listen, now that I know that... Deckard is a replicant. Yeah, I don't and think And he, he has no past <laughs> and he's so alone. He, he they're they're lonely. The fact that they have they have feelings, they have emotion, they need other people. And he's dealing with killing all of these replicants. And he says, uh, well, we're not there yet, but there is a moment where he says, Are you do you have the shakes? Are you shaking? So the fact, like, you talk about a test, like, she killed somebody, and she's shaking for it, and he says, you know, it's part of the job. She says, I'm not part of the job. I am the job. I am the job. Great line. Yeah. And, Great line. you know, the, the amount of alcohol that he's drinking throughout the thing, like, he's dealing. So the fact that he just attaches to her and that she attaches, like, why does she go to his apartment? you know, over and over and try to convince him is because she, he, he's really the only person she knows on the outside. Yeah, I hear all of that. I just, in our modern or enlightened age, when a guy is putting, physically putting the moves on a girl and she says no. No, no, we're not there yet. We'll get to that. I know, but I'm just saying, that's, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. that's where it gets a little uncomfortable for me. So he goes to get the scale analyzed and, and it is an artificial snake. The, 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 the cells of the snake have a, a barcode, a serial code, right? Mm -hmm. And now he's going to track down the person who purchased the snake because he found the scales in Leon's apartment. He knows now that the, the, there was a woman there with the snake. He's seen that in the picture. And so if he can find that woman, she's probably a replicant, and she can also probably lead him to Leon. It's, uh, one thing I want to talk a little bit because he goes to one of those stands like, you know, where they sell noodles and, you know, where he was eating before whatever. And he gives her the scale and she, she reads it for him and he's there. But I want to say like in the book, the, the final war has happened. The world is falling apart and most people are off world and, and it's very sparsely populated. And, there's, well, and, and almost all the animals are dead. And almost all the animals, I think, I don't, there's only the dove, I, I don't, there's no animals in this. There's no children, there's no animals, uh, but the bird um, yeah, the in dove. this. So, but, the, but what Ridley Scott does, which I think is, you know, compelling visually, is it is packed. It is always packed. They're always, and I, what I take this to mean is that now that it's the end of times and that the world is sparsely populated, but everybody's cramming in the cities because it's really the only place, the only place to live. It's the only place to really like eat out a living. So every time uh, you see the streets, they're packed full of people. But when you go in the buildings, the buildings are vacant. For instance, like Sebastian's apartment or, you know, uh, the, the building that he lives in. But I don't want to jump ahead when you get there. But he finds out about the snake and there's a code in there. Yeah, which then leads him to the club where Zora is dancing with the snake. Now, when he gets to the club, one thing that is uh, that I do wonder about is what what prompts him to call Rachel in that moment. Well, I mean, they they had the interaction at his apartment, um, and you think he has he, remorse from how he, he treated her? Well, I think I think he 
I think is also clearly attracted to her. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is Sean Young at the height of her beauty. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he clearly has a, a powerful attraction to her. I think he also does feel bad about the way he treated her. I think he, I think he feels guilty for doing that. Again, it's that soldier thing of like, you treat people bad when you think you might have to kill them. And then later, many soldiers feel a great deal of regret for that. They feel bad about the way they treated the population of the countries they were in. But there's what they had to do at the time. But then later you look back and you go, God, I wish I had, wasn't such an asshole. I think there's some of that here. I think, I think there's, you know, he's like, I have to keep an emotional distance from you guys because my job is killing you guys. But then later he's gone, but I kind of feel like an asshole because I treated, I treated Rachel like a dick. You know, she's innocent in all this. She hasn't done anything wrong. No reason to be mean to her. And I, yeah, I think you, I think he's attracted to her and he feels bad for the way he treated her both. Yeah. I think, you know, he goes to the club. People are having a good time. He's alone. He's lonely. He's packed. One of my and, favorite character actors, weirdo character actors, shows up as the club owner. I love that dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. man is dry. The man is dry. Give him <laughs> Give him that. I love that guy. He's awesome. Every time and, he shows up in a movie, I'm, I'm happy. And then he sees uh, Zora on stage with the snake, yep. and she does her routine. Well, we never really see her. We hear the description of what's happening, and we see his reaction to it. Oh, that's right. But we don't yeah. see her. That is so true. So he's like, watch well, how she takes the pleasures from the serpent's tongue. <laughs> and he like looks away like he's embarrassed. Oh, right? well, what do you think the show is? What do you think happens in the show? I think you know what happens in that show. <laughs> uh, I want to hear you say it. We don't have children that listen to this. You can. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I, think that, I think there is a, a bit of... Um, Naughtiness going on with that snake. <laughs> okay. A little um, tomfoolery. But the one, I think for me, one of the things, there's a few scenes that don't work for me. And one of them we're going to get to. But the next one that I don't get to is when he puts on that, we that voice. Like, hey, I'm uh, so-and-so from the so-and-so union, and yeah. I'm coming in, and I need to talk to you, but don't worry. I'm not going to make a join. Like, I don't know. It's, it's like, a, what it's, the fuck it is, is he doing? It is a very strange choice. <laughs> a very strange because, choice. Because she doesn't know him. If he uses right. his normal voice, it's not like he's in disguise. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It's, it's, it is, it's a very odd choice that he made, and I don't know if it was Harrison Ford's choice or Ridley Scott pushed him to do it, or I don't know where that choice came from. But it is very, it's a very strange way to approach the scene. Because if you picture that scene exactly the same, but him just using his normal voice, mm -hmm. nothing changes. Nothing changes. <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute, you haven't done this through the whole movie. You don't seem like you're that type of person. I don't know. I guess it's a replicant thing. I don't really understand it. It's, it's very odd. It's a very yeah, odd. It's very odd. But I think that, uh, you know, one of the Harrison Ford's complaints and it's, you know, what's interesting is like you do the research, you do the research back when, the, when they were making the movie, the behind the scenes, you hear what they're yeah. saying. Then you, you, uh, when they did the re-release and the director's cut in like the early 2000s and then all the stuff before they did 2019, their stories kind of change. Like even really Scott's stories change. But in the, in the, the time when Harrison Ford read the script, one of his complaints were like, you don't really see me do much detective work. I think they added that scene where he finds the scale in the bathroom because he's like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, who, you know, what's going on? So he kind of has yeah. that same thing that you and I bumped against that's that like, he's a bit passive and well, he okay. kind of, so if you, if you, if you track the movie as presented, he gets the pictures, he goes to where Leon lives. He finds the pictures and the snake scale. He, uses the device that lets him like zoom in on all the different parts of the picture, sees the woman with the snake, takes the scale to the person says, where, where did this snake come from? The person says, oh, this guy made the snake. He goes to that guy. The guy says, oh, I sold the snake to this lady. He tracks the lady to the club. So that is detective. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is going from clue to clue to clue to get and to her. And now, I think he prompted that. Is when he confronts her and she just kicks the shit out of him. She... <laughs> kills him she's going to kill him and yep. then other people walk in and she ran away now yep. to go into a little bit of the difference between 1982 and every other movie that's on every other sci-fi movie every other fantasy movie and this movie is the way that one of the major differences is how they handle the violence 
And we talk about fight consistency at all times and, you know, and, and how it adds to a film. Well, this one has it very strong. And first of all, Harrison Ford is just bumbling through that fucking crowd and blazing away and, and, and just, and, I mean, I am surprised eight people didn't die when he's shooting <laughs> this girl. But when he shoots Zora, there is nothing, it is a, it is a murder. Like it, it there's feels, nothing heroic about it. There's nothing heroic. He shoots her in the back. She falls like tragically through panes of glass. Yeah. Well, he shoots you know. her once. She goes down and then she's still fighting to live. Yeah. She gets back up. She tries to run again. Yeah. You know, with that huge gaping wound in her shoulder and blood right. pouring out and she's still trying to live. And then he shoots her in the back again. Right. And that's when she finally goes down and stays down. I do find it interesting. She's so scantily clad. And then when she goes out, she puts on a jacket that's see through, and it's like, wh- why do you why put on the jacket? You know, it's, just a, it's, go a, it's to keep the rain off of you. Oh, it's like a right. plastic it's a rain. rain oh, thing. it's a rain yeah. jacket. Yeah, because it's um, always raining. Yeah, it's always raining there. Yeah, but he blasts her, and she rolls over, and it's just such a shoddy job. Yeah, it's such a terrible job, and the violence throughout all of this. There's no movie violence to this it's it's horrific it feels wrong it feels sad and when they roll her over and you see him and he's like just completely shocked about what he's done like violence wasn't being handled like this in in around 1982 and the type of movies that were coming out in this genre well and it's and it's not shot to be exciting it's it's done in slow motion yeah it's it's she gets shot in the back and she's like you said, she staggers through glass and then she tries to get back up again. And he's still running up. He shoots her again in the back again. She's not fighting back. She's not shooting back at him. You know, the, the eighties version of this, she would have had a gun too. It would have been a running gun battle, but it's shot to be exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of exciting camera angles. That's the eighties version. And yeah. this has none of that. The violence wasn't fun in this. Yeah. It's not fun. It wasn't even choreographed. It was like raw, gritty, and just, it was, it was too real. And then Bryant shows up with Gaff, and this goes back to my theory, which kind of fits into place, because I was always a, a, a Decker's not a replicant guy, but then I watched I have, his replicant. I have, I have one killer rebuttal for Decker's replicant that I'll wait till the end, but it is a killer rebuttal of that. It kills the thing. What, is There's it because, no way it works. Is it because he doesn't have super strength? No. And he gets his ass kicked through the whole movie? No, it's not because of that. Oh, okay. But uh, Brian shows up and he's like, hey, hey, you know, Deck, Gaff, you need to pay attention to him. He's a one man killing machine. And it just makes sense. And I know it's probably not the choice in the script. Maybe it was literally, but it makes sense to me that he's fucking with him. Like I watch it if he's fucking with him. And it makes sense to me that Gaff and him are humans. He's a replicant. He doesn't know he's a replicant. And they're just fucking with him because they're sending him on the most dangerous jobs because they're not going to fucking do it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I would say that the acting choices, the, what's the name of the actor who plays uh, Bryant? Very famous. Fantastic uh, character actor. Character actor. If only, if only anyway. we had a producer that could chime yeah. in and give us names when we need them. Give me a second, man. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I wasn't I, a criticism. I, I, just, I just had it up, and then, of course, I closed it as I was looking at other things. I will have it. Stop in streaming porn in the background while I we're know, doing the show. It is Emmett Walsh. No, Emmett, I, thank I was you. looking Emmett at Walsh. other fun things. The other but, porn. Yes. Right. Hey, yeah. I, I can guarantee you, Joseph is going to be pro non replicant. But Joseph, is Decker a replicant or not? He's, he's going to say he's not a replicant. I, I, well, I grew up with him not being a replicant. And then when I was in high school, I went to go see, um, I forget which one it was, which edition it was. They were playing it in downtown what, Chicago. What year? It was like, it was in the, the, was it that the 90s, mid nineties. And that was when Ridley Scott put back in the, the unicorn stuff and all that. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, he, he is a replicant. But, you know, honestly, now I want to go watch, I want to watch the original, but without the narration. Yeah, the narration really is not a good choice. Without the narration. When we, you know, when we get think... to the end, we, when we get to the end, we'll talk about the three different uh, editions and, and yeah. the pros and cons of them. Yeah. But the thing is, I think M.M. at Walsh is making acting choices. He seems like he is making fun in every scene. Like he's just, he just has this taunting arrogance about him. 
Um, and, and for me, it really ties into that moment when he says, you know, the score, if you're not cops, you're little people. He thinks he's the top dog. He's the police chief. He's, he's in charge, right? He's a police captain. So, so he's just, he thinks everybody's shit and he is the top shit, right? So I, that, for me, that's how that plays. But, yeah. but we get that, we get the, the moment of, of Zora being killed and then it builds up to the moment of Leon. Yeah. Yeah, Harrison and, Ford just kind of recovers from the yeah, whole yeah. fucking thing, and then Leon comes and stomps his ass all up and down the street. Hey, guys, thanks for watching the first half of our two-parter Blade Runner episode, because Blade Runner is too amazing to be contained in a single episode. If we tried to put it in one episode, it would explode. That episode would kill half the continent. So we got to put it in two just for everybody's safety. Thanks for listening to it. We'll be back next week with the second half.